Good morning and welcome to JCC this morning. We're continuing with our summer message series on the Sermon on the Mount today. And so we're going to continue with this series. We're going to continue to unpack it and just really discover all that God has in store for us. I want to encourage you um, to, to read, reread, and read again the Sermon on the Mount. It's three chapters. It's Matthew uh, uh, chapter 5, 6, and 7. And really, these three chapters really do an incredible job at just uh, highlighting the heart and teaching of Jesus. And so I want to encourage you to read them over and over again. And uh, as we read through the Sermon on the Mount, we discover so many powerful truths in it. We discover uh, the depth in the inside of the very heart of God. In my opinion, we really, really unpack the heart of God. And last week, we discovered who we are in Christ. In fact, our takeaway was a direct reflection of that. And our takeaway was simply this, you are salt and light in Christ. You are salt and light in Christ. Now, the challenge for me with that is that so many in our times in our lives, we define ourselves by our past. We, we define ourselves by our present situation, or quite possibly we define ourselves by the uncertainties that await us. Like we just allow these things, our past, our present, our future, we allow those things to just bombard us, right? And, and, and we really tend to identify with our past. We tend to identify with these things. And what I want to say is I want to remind us that Jesus called us, his followers, his disciples. He says, you are, not you will be, he says, you are salt and light. But in life, we have so many things that would cause us to be not, not full of, of flavor, but to be on the other flip side of that, to be salty, right? To be a little bit bitter. We have a lot of things that would embitter us. But what we need to know today is that we are salt and light in Christ. Um, as we continue this morning, we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to continue walking through the Sermon on the Mount. And I want to challenge you today to be a student of God's Word. So I want to just challenge you you for a moment with this underlining thought. Every one of you listening to the sound of my voice, I want to challenge you to be a student of God's Word, to be somebody who is constantly learning, that you are constantly developing in your walk with God, that you're constantly developing in your understanding of God's Word. And let me just say that it is one of those things where ultimately, as we uh, unpack God's Word, it's important for us to know that, that it's a lifelong journey. Like, we're not going to learn it all in a day, but we're going to learn it daily. We need to be students of God's Word. And so, more than just casually approaching God's Word, I want to challenge you to go all in. In our current series, that's exactly what we're doing. That's what we do every summer is we take an opportunity to dig further, further into God's Word. And I want to encourage you, as we unpack this series in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, that you would go beyond the Sunday morning experience. That you would read it, that you would discover it. In fact, today we're going to cover a lot of scripture. We're going to, in fact, we're going to cover way too much today. I'm just going to forewarn you that's what's going to happen. So what I want to encourage you to do today is to take notes. If, if, I encourage you to do it all the time, but today's one of those days where you're going to take either mental notes, you're going to write some notes down uh, in your phone, maybe you're going to have a notepad. I don't know what works for you, but you're going to take some notes because today it's going to be a lot of information. And maybe as we go through our exploration today, you're going to have some notes where you're going to say, hey, I have a question about that. And I want to discover that further, and I want to read more about that, and I want, to, I want to really unpack that further because it's going to be a lot of information. We're tackling a large portion of Scripture. It's an in-depth portion of, of Scripture, and there's no way that, truth be told, we can do it justice here this morning. There's just too much information. And in fact, I really think we could spend, to be honest, I think we can spend about six to seven weeks on what we're going to cover today in a normal message series. So... Uh, we can spend about six to seven weeks in a normal uh, message series, but we're not, we're not going to do that. We're going to just focus on uh, it, getting through it today. Um, and so with that being said, let's jump right in. Uh, I want to encourage you to pay, take, pay close attention and then to take a lot of notes. But here we go. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 17. Now, Jesus continues on. This is right where we left off from last week. Uh, Jesus continues in the teaching in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. He starts out with this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And so Jesus sets the tone for what we just learned, what we just came out of. And now he starts to set the tone for the next portion of Scripture and like the next 
portion of the teaching. He just came out of talking about who we are as his followers, his disciples. We are salt and we are light. And now he gets into something where he talks uh, just a little bit different. And actually it gets really heavy in what we're going to talk about today. But the first thing he says is, look, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And really what he's saying is, look, uh, so many people think, well, Jesus came to uh, do away with the law. But no, he came to fulfill the law. In fact, in the greatest way, he came to fill the law, fulfill the law. Why? Because he, is, he came to this life, to, and he lived a sinless life on earth so that he can offer his life for every one of us. It's the gospel message. Like, that is the fulfillment of the law, that he lived a sinless life and that he came and he died on a cross to offer you and I salvation. We've talked a lot about this recently, especially with Easter not too far away from us. We've talked about the death and resurrection of Christ, but in it, it is truly the greatest fulfillment of the law. Now, I don't have time to unpack this today, but in the law, it was a series of rules, really. It was a series of do this and do that. Um, and ultimately, in, in all of that, it was this opportunity for us to kind of have a list of rules. But then there was also like, if you don't do that, this is going to happen. And it was this, uh, like, like it, it was rules. But Jesus is challenging us today to see beyond that. And he's challenging us to see that like he's the fulfillment of the law, that not only would he fulfill the law, but that also he himself would be the ultimate sacrifice for the law, for for our sins rather. And so uh, lots of information, but let's come back to the text. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Uh, One last note before I uh, move on, and that is that in the law, what we have to understand that when he talks about the law, he's really talking about the Old Testament. He's talking about the law, which is the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. It's talking about the history of the nation of Israel. There's a lots of information in there. When we hear law, we oftentimes think the, the Ten Commandments. But the Ten Commandments is found in Exodus 20. It's a few short verses. Man, we're talking about books and books of the Bible. So it's the law and the prophets. They're all of those uh, prophets who wrote in the Old Testament from uh, the major prophets to the minor prophets. And when you say, well, who were majors and who were minors? It's not like minor leagues, you know. It's not that at all. It's not like these were the majors, you know what I'm saying. They were the prophets that were the A-gamers, and then these were the minor prophets that were the less than A-gamers. No, what it means is major prophets, meaning these long extended books like Isaiah and Jeremiah, they're long books. And then there's these minor prophets like Joel that they're just really short books. And so that's the difference. Maybe to TMI, that's okay. We're students of God's word, right? Okay, so that's what's happening. Jesus is saying, look, that's what the, old, the law and the prophets are. And then he reads on, verse 18, it reads on, For truly I tell you, it, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest stroke or letter, no, no, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Verse 19, therefore anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called what? Great in the kingdom of heaven. And so what he begins to paint is this picture where ultimately he's saying, look, there's going to be those that are least in the kingdom of heaven, and there's those that are going to be great in the kingdom. The least will be those who not only do not adhere to the word of God, but then even teach others to do the opposite. Now, uh, on the flip side, those that are going to be great are going to be those that put Jesus' words, that that, that put in the words of God, uh, the word of Jesus into practice. We kind of talked in this series about that. That that when we started this series, we talked about putting the Word of God into practice. I said it today. It's more than information. We're going to give a lot of information today, but it's got to be more than just up here. There's a lot of people who know better but don't do better. Amen? Right? And so it's not just information. It's got to ooze into our hearts and cause transformation and ultimately out of our hands and feet and become application. And so it's about applying the Word of God to our lives. And then Jesus gets to that latter portion of this text uh, in the beginning, this last a highlighted moment. Let's go to the next verse. It says, verse 20, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is teaching. He's talking to the disciples, to the crowds, and he's teaching and he's saying, look, the, he's, he's making a great challenge in verse 20. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of God. 
Now what he's contrasting is that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the teachers of the law during that time, they were really good at really playing the part, but they weren't, they weren't the part. Right? They, they, they were really good at putting on a facade, this is who I am, but deep down in their hearts, that's not really what they believed. In fact, we're going to talk a lot more about this next week in the message series as we continue on. We're going to really talk about the hard issue of, 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 of the, what we're talking about today, but uh, of this particular text, which is this righteousness. And really, what the Pharisees had was this self-righteousness that said, look at me. And they looked it on the, on, on the outside, man. They looked apart, they, they, but they lacked integrity. They lacked the, the authenticity that said, look, this is not just who I am in public. This is who I am in the, the most private place. And, and really, none of us are perfect, amen? And uh, maybe you're sitting, somebody next to, sitting next to somebody who's perfect, but, uh, you know, I know I'm not perfect, right? And so here's the thing. None of us are perfect, but really... Jesus is challenging us to have a righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees. In other words, he's saying, look, don't just externally look the part. He's saying internally you have to be the part. Be the part. In, and even in through all of our imperfections, we've got to know that, that we can, that we've got to, God is, Jesus here is talking about the heart issue. He's not talking about the rules, but he's really talking about relationships. In fact, the kingdom of God is about relationships. God, God wants, to, wants us to restore our relationship with him, and ultimately he wants us to restore relationships with others. And so Jesus gets into some really hot topics as he moves forward today. In fact, Jesus proceeds into diving into some really challenging topics. He does so by engaging in six topics. We're going to cover them really quickly today. There are six topics, and he starts each topic off with saying, you have heard. And really what he's saying by you have heard is you've heard in the law, you've heard in the prophets, you've heard over the the course of history that that the story has been shared from one generation to the next. There was this this, uh, oral tradition of, of the ancestors sharing the word of God story after story. And so they were they were living this out, they were walking this out, and and he says, You have heard, but then he goes on, and Jesus, in the next six thoughts here, he challenges the status quo. And let me just be honest, it's going to be a little uncomfortable this morning um, for your neighbor, not for you. <laughs> because he really, he, you know, in fact, he gets to the heart issue. He gets to the issue of the heart. He's not just talking about these rules and regulations. He's talking about the heart issue and relationships. And Jesus goes on to talk about some real popular subjects, you know. In fact, they're great conversation starters. You ever want to be the life of the party? Start with these, all right? Here they are. They're murder. Let's talk about that one. Adultery, that sounds like a great topic for conversation. Let's talk about divorce. How about that one, you know? Oaths, making oaths or, or, or committing to vows or promises. He goes on to talk about uh, eye for an eye. We're going to get into that one a little bit more like revenge is one of the thoughts that, that comes to my mind when I think about eye for an eye. But, but if, if, if you never heard this, this, and we're going to get into it in a second, but when I think about eye for eye, I like to use it and think quite literally, like, you know, eye for an eye. Like, you took my eye, I'm going to take your eye. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, what am I going to use? Am I going to use a spoon to get that eye out? I'll just, I just, just mess with y'all, right? Like, you're just like, that's, that's, you just like, we were fine. We're ready to go home now. I lost my appetite. I can't eat today. The Bible says eye for eye. We're going to get to that. But these are great conversation starters. And then the last one is this. Love your enemies. No, 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 wait, Jesus. You don't understand. We don't love our enemies. We hate our enemies. We try to get revenge on them. And we try to get them back for every bad thing they've ever done to us. And then Jesus is like, no, 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 no. I'm telling you, love your neighbors. Or love your enemies, rather. And love your neighbors. He gets to that one, too. So let's jump right into it. Hot topic number one, murder. Murder. Chapter 5, verse 21. And Jesus says, you have heard, again, all of these start off with this. Uh, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago. You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. And everybody who's listening to Jesus at this moment is all shaking their heads. Except for the guy that, you know, has been guilty of murder. He's just like, maybe nobody will notice, right? And, you know, here's the thing, man. I've interacted with murderers in my life, you know, like, like this. That's not a big deal. Um, 
But here's, here's what it's saying. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. And so most of us are in agreement at this moment. Most of us are like, yeah, you know, we get it. Like, this makes sense. You know, somebody kills somebody else. There's judgment that comes their way. Then Jesus says the next verse. And this is where everything gets just flipped on its, on its head here. Verse 22, it says, but I tell you. Now, Jesus says, you've heard, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with their brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Here's the thing. We all like to justify ourselves, Right? Let's be honest. It's just in our heart. It's in our nature. Like we want to justify ourselves. And so we come to God or we come to others and it's like, you know, hey man, here's the deal. I, I've done some real bad things in my life, but I haven't done as bad, you know, I haven't done things like they have, you know. And uh, we, we start to quantify and justify ourselves about, you know, those things that maybe we've done wrong. And Jesus says, you know what, uh, you know, he who's murdered uh, is subject to judgment. But he says, if you have anger in your heart, you're subject to the same judgment. And we go, oh, 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 hold on. Jesus, you don't understand. He killed somebody. I just thought about it. No, 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 Jesus, you don't understand. He's the one that actually punched somebody in the face, choked them unconscious, but I just thought about it. I get a pass, right? Right? I often joke around about jujitsu because I love the game so much. And I say this, I, get to, I, I, cho- I choke people literally unconscious at times so that I don't choke anybody unconscious at other times. <laughs> and it is extremely fun. You should try it one day. The point that Jesus is making is he's saying, look, you know, you've heard it said this way, but I'm challenging you to realize that if there's anger in your heart, because again, Jesus wants to reconcile us to him, but he also wants us to be reconciled one to another. And so many times we walk around with grudges and anger in our heart, and we walk around with these things, and God wants us to be free from those things. We're going to get to that in the latter part of this as well. Like this thing is layered upon layer upon layer, but he's saying here, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister is subject to the same judgment. And really God is trying to get into the issue of our hearts. And I know that I need work on my heart. I know that I need to be exposed and say, Jesus, would you work on my heart? Because there are times where I'm angry. There's times where, you know, somebody cuts me off in tra- traffic and they flip me off. And then I realize they come to the church and they say later, you know what? My finger was broken. It was actually a peace sign. Just the other one didn't come up. <laughs> God bless you too, my brother. And I noticed your sign language, but it was two hands out the window. How did you do that? Just kidding. <laughs> anyway. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to the same judgment. And in your life, with your coworkers, in your marriage, with your children, you have to really, God is trying to get to the heart issue. Like, what is going on in your heart? And, and, and trust me, it's messy on the inside of there at times, right? Like, it's messy, but God wants to get to the anger issue of our hearts. And I'm, I, I know what it's like to be angry, and Jesus is getting to this. Look, it's beyond just the physical act of murder. He's saying if you've been angry in your heart, you've got to deal with that. And there's a few more verses I would encourage you to, again, go through and read. We're not going to read them today. But in that particular uh, subject about murder, there's more verses, and it's saying, look, you got to deal with that. you got to reconcile. you got to fix those relationships. It moves on. Next hot topic, woo, right into the deep end of the pool. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And this is where we live in a culture that, uh, you know, is very permissive. We live in a culture that's very permissive, and we don't, we don't like to talk in these kind of absolutes, and we say things like, well, you know, I didn't actually, uh, you know, have an affair. I just thought about having an affair. I didn't actually do anything. I just, you know, messaged on Facebook. It was all nice. It was just high. It wasn't anything like, you know, come on, let's be real. Or, or here's the thing. We live in a culture that is bombarded with, Um, this, let's just be honest, man, we live in a culture that's bombarded with social media, or like technology, um, pornography, and and it's it's a difficult space to be in. It's a difficult world to live in, and what we do is we quantify these things. Again, just like with murder, we say, well, it's not that bad. I didn't actually do anything. I thought about doing it a lot, but I didn't actually do it. 
And we're all like, every one of us just said, hmm, like, awkward. Sunday morning, we're talking about some strange stuff at church. Stuff we don't like to talk about. But here's the thing. Jesus is saying, look, it's not an issue of, of, of the act of adultery. It's an issue of the condition of the heart, and we need to guard our hearts. And I want to just say this to every man and every woman in this place, like guard your heart. And you know what? You, the, the best way for you to guard your heart is to guard these, you know, guard your eyes. And you know what? Every time you see that thing that you know you shouldn't see, you just got to go like, you use the power of the neck. It's called the, the neck turn. You just go. Yeah. You know, just block it out. You got to just ignore it. Maybe it's on social media. Maybe it's somebody in your life that, you know, here's the thing. You've been, you've been playing footsie with somebody that you shouldn't be playing footsie with, and you just need to say, you know what? Get out of my life in the name of Jesus. And no, don't, don't kick them. Don't kick them. But you need to kick them to the curb in another sense, if you know what I'm saying. Maybe that's for you online. I don't know who that's for. You've heard, and the, again, Jesus is getting to the heart of the issue, and the heart of the issue is the heart. That, look, it's not just about this external, this is what I did, it's about the internal, this is what I thought, and this is a whole other level of teaching here. Because everybody was comfortable with, yeah, you know, get him, get her, and then you realize, we're all guilty. And you realize, that's why we needed the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And we're, how many of you are grateful for that this morning? And so you've heard, do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who has lust in his heart has already committed adultery. It's so much more challenging. We read on the next one. He gets into the next one, and this one is like painful because it's divorce. None of us want to talk about divorce. In fact, for many of us in this place today, we've been affected by divorce. Maybe, uh, you know, I, I talked about this in the first service, and, and I'll say it here again. You know, my wife and I are both products of divorce. Our parents, both of our parents, uh, ha have been, uh, you know, divorced, and, and, and uh, you know, there's been all kinds of relational challenge with that and difficulty because of it. And some of you, you know, you're, you're looking at us, and you're saying, man, how lucky are you? I wish my parents would have divorced. You know, they're better off without each other. And, you know, there's all kinds of things we feel about relationships, Right. And the truth is, is that the Bible is, address, Jesus is addressing divorce here. And he's saying, look, um, let's not get it confused. This was not God's plan. Let's read on. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. Again, it is said, and this comes from the tradition of Moses. This was not originally God's idea, but it was the people that they had a lot of conflict with each other. It's the same thing we face today in relationships. We face conflicts, right? We face disagreements. And so what they did is they said, hey, let's create a certificate of divorce so that somebody can do away with the divorce, tie it up nice and pretty, and it's over and it's done and we move on. And Jesus is uh, addressing that very topic in verse 32. He says, but I tell you, that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual morality, in other words, if, if, if there's any other reason but for this, he makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery as well. And it's like, okay, dude, that's like a sledgehammer. Because I think every one of us in this room, I, I would be confident to say, every one of us in this room has been closely affected by divorce, whether We've been divorced, our parents have been divorced, our spouse's parents have been divorced, our, our, your cousins, our aunties, our uncles, you know, and some of us, you know, we've been not only divorced once and twice and three times, four, five, you know, yeah, we've been there, you know, um, and we're still trying to work it out. That's okay. Thank God for his grace, right? But let me say this, divorce is not God's plan. And let me just say to every one of you, whether you're, you're struggling in your marriage or you've, been, or you've already walked through a divorce, like you need to let the shame fall off and you need to know that like you can't change what's been done, but you can change yourself moving forward from today. What's done is done. It's in the past. You can't change it, but you can change moving forward. If you're struggling in your marriage, 
And if you're breathing, you probably at some degree are, because <laughs> that's the nature of life. You may be having a conflict. There may be a little itty-bitty conflict, but those little itty-bitty conflicts are the very conflicts that, God, that the enemy uses to divide us, isolate us, and then separate us. Because when we're in isolation, the enemy wins. The more we're isolated from one another in our marriage, the more that we begin to think all these stupid thoughts, right? Like, where, where is she? Why haven't I seen her today? You know, uh, who's she talking to? Uh, she's at work. She's talking to clients. Stupid. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, but uh, I haven't heard from her, you know? And I, I say that funny because that's what we do, right? Isolation. I'm using that analogy just to paint the picture, and that is that the enemy wants to isolate us. He wants to isolate you here, and this is, man, we don't have enough time for this, but just hear me out. God's design for marriage is oneness. The Bible says that the two shall become one. That's more than a physical act of marriage. It's more than a, the physical act, and adults, you know what I mean by that. It's more than the physical act of marriage, of oneness. No, no, no. He, there's this connection of oneness that, that goes beyond the physical act, and it's about becoming one. The enemy wants to divide us. And so for those of you that are married and you're fighting through something, I want to challenge you, don't give up on yourself, don't give up on your spouse, don't give up on your marriage. The grass always looks greener on the other side, but I'm telling you, it's just as problematic on the other side. It looks good from the outside looking in, but it's not. Work on prioritizing your marriage, and I know it's difficult, but you got to do the tough work. You see, Mary and I will be married Next month, a month, almost just a month away, July 7th, we will be married 18 years. Dude, incredible. I cannot believe she married me at three years old. Goodness, she was older than me. Cougar. I was not going to say it in this service, but I couldn't help myself. So, focus on your marriage. God's design is oneness. The enemy wants to divide you. All right, let's keep moving forward. There's a lot of information here. So we move on to the next one. We deal with, um, we deal with divorce. The next one, verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people. Again, you have heard. Again, this idea of this is what's been said. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath. But fulfill, the Lord, uh, fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, again, Jesus flips the script here. He's saying, look, you've heard. He says, but I tell you, do not swear an oath at all. Do not. In fact, this portion of Scripture, fast forwarding to verse 37, finishes with this. It says this in verse 37. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You see, I don't, I've never liked the idea of making promises. I just don't like it. And somewhere along the line, our kids around three or four years old, they learn this thing to say, you promised. And, I'm, and, and, and I'll never forget my daughters, you know, they, they somewhere learn this idea of telling me, dad, you promised. And I looked at them and said, you're a liar. Get behind me, Satan. I think the second message series is always gets funnier as we go through the day. I don't know why. But the truth is, is that our kids learn this thing like, you promised. And I'm like, I didn't promise you anything. You lying, you know. But I would try my best to do that. And my wife, she, she's one of those. I'm like, this is, you know, this is where I can call her out a little bit. She, she loves to promise. She, she loves, like, she loves the idea of me promising, you know. It's like, I promise you, baby, I will honor you for all of my days. I will never be upset with you, not even for an ounce of any day at any moment. I promise. <laughs> but we all know that's a lie, right? We know it's a lie. And for no good reason, I'm going to be upset on days. And my wife just said, amen, you grumpy old man. <laughs> and the truth is, though, is that when we look at this, the, the, the Bible is challenging us. Jesus is challenging us with don't make all these oaths. Don't make these promises. Just let, just be a person of your word. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be a person of your word. 
It's a lot easier said than done. But Jesus is saying, be a person of your word. All right, moving on. The next one he gets in is verse 38. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone uh, slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them, to turn them, turn to them the other cheek also. Reading on. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand them over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. This is this challenging part of, you know, eye for an eye. Y'all thinking about spoons. At lunch, you're not even going to use a spoon. You're going to only use forks and knives. The point is this, is that this idea of eye for an eye, like, and really what this is, this is about keeping track. This is about keeping record. That one time you did that one thing, I'll never forget it, and I'll hate you forever because of it. And we do that a lot of times in our lives. We do that as children. I remember when my mom, I remember when my dad, I remember when they did, I remember when my older brother, man, oh man, what time is it, man? I remember when my older brother, we left the swimming pool. I was opening my eyes all day long under the water. How many of y'all do that under the water? Then, then at the end of the swimming day, your eyes are burning. They're bloodshot. It looked like you smoked a lot of stuff, but you were three years old. More like seven. And so you're walking home from the pool, and you have your wet towel, and you put it on your eyes, and you're like, oh, that feels so good. Just stop for a moment. And your older brother, because he loves you so much, he says, don't worry. Keep it on there. I will lead you. I'm your older, wiser, more compassionate brother, and I will lead you into the truth of God's word with a towel on your face. And we walk. And at the moment, I'm feeling relief and peace and joy, and all of a sudden, my face bumps into a telephone pole. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> okay, moving on. I don't know. That one was fun. High five. The point is this, is we want to keep track of all these things. And you know what? It's not eye for an eye. You know, trust me, I wasn't, you know, I wanted to run him into a pole, but he was much older than me then, and I was like not going to even try it. And so the point is this, we're not, we're, our job is not to keep records of wrongs. We're not to say eye for an eye. No, Jesus is saying, you know what? If somebody wants to, you know, is asking you for something, give. If somebody hits you, turn to the other cheek, be like, come on, is that all you got, baby? Bring it on. Maybe don't do that, but you know, the point is the heart. And so then it concludes with a couple more thoughts you have heard. And the last one here. So we go back to the text in verse 43. It says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And everybody at that moment goes, mm-hmm, yep, that's what's been said. We get it. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That you may be children of of your Father in heaven. This is where it gets tough. Because then we go to a moment where we say, nope, mm -mm." You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And we all get that. We're all signed up for that one. But he says instead, going back to the beginning of the verse, in verse 43, the challenge is here. It says, love your neighbor, or verse 44, but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. See, here's the thing. Some of you today, you're living with grudges in your heart. You're living with all this challenge in your heart. And, and what you, you, you got a hate issue with somebody and you're mad at them. And you got a list of what they did and when they did it and how they did it. And you're, you're upset. But I'm telling you, it's not affecting them. It's only affecting you. And you need to let go and let God heal your heart. And the way you heal your heart is you begin to love your enemy, and sometimes the enemy, there's an enemy within, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes the enemy's in your own house, and you need to humble yourself, and you need to love, and you need to pray for, because not because it's going to fix them, but because it's going to fix your heart. And that's what Jesus is getting to. And so in all of this, Jesus drops some deep truth 
in what we discover today. He is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He challenges us to live a truly righteous life, one that exceeds that of the hypocritical Pharisees. His teaching is deep, it's direct, and it's absolutely life-changing. And today, although we can only cover it in more of what I would call a survey format, I would challenge you to go deeper. I want to repeat something I said as I started out today. And that is, be a student of God's word. More than simply hearing his word, strive to practice his word at the highest level possible. We'll never reach perfection on this earth, but we can reach towards it. Matthew chapter 5 concludes with a challenging statement. In verse 48 it says this, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. As we strive to study and live out God's word, may this be our pursuit, a pursuit of perfection. Will we ever reach it? No. Can we get close? I don't know, what, I, I don't know how you would define close, but we can reach for it. We can reach for that. We can push ourselves and challenge ourselves. And in fact, I would give you this takeaway today. Perfection is impossible, but its pursuit is absolutely necessary. Perfection is impossible. We all know it. We all get a pass. We all know that we're going to fail at moments. We all know that as we unpack God's word and there's so much con confrontational truth for us, we know that we're going to fail and falter, but we're going to reach as far as we can because perfection is impossible, but its pursuit is absolutely necessary. Every day we say, God, we're going to pursue you. Would you close your eyes for a second? If you're ever going to pursue what God, being perfection, if you're ever going to be a true student of God's word, it starts in a life-giving relationship with Christ. And if you're here today and you've never committed your life to Christ, or you're here today and maybe you've walked away from that commitment to Christ, I want to give you the opportunity to recommit or commit for the first time right here, right now. And if that's you and you say, that's me, I need to commit or recommit, would you just lift your hand real high today? Hands going up. That's you real high. Just say, that's me. I need to commit or recommit. Hands real high and then put them right back down. Hands all over. God sees them. And for everyone listening to the sound of my voice, God sees your hand. For everyone listening to the sound of my voice, I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer with me. Would you say, Jesus, today I commit all that I am to you. From this day forward, teach me your ways. Make me a student that applies your word. Show me your love. Let me know you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we just put our hands together and thank God for those that are responding?